hello and uh, a very welcome, good welcome to you all on behalf of the Royal Society of Edinburgh. Uh, it, this is uh, an event which the Royal Society has put on, which is part of something called Throwback Thursday. And uh, I've been asked to chair it today. My name is Stuart Munro. I'm one of the, the co-conveners of the Public Engagement uh, Committee of the Royal Society of Edinburgh. And what we're trying to do is to engage with people so that uh, they can actually, the, uh, some of our speakers from the past can come back and relive that moment when they talked to you previously, but also reflect on that over the last few months and see where that takes us. We're going to have a question and answer session at the end, and I will be, you can join in on the Q&A uh, by using the Q&A tag at the foot of the screen. Uh, but before that, what we're going to do is actually show you the, uh, the piece that was produced by our speaker today. And our speaker today was Professor Neve McDay. And Neve is well known to many people uh, as the Professor of Forensic Science at the University of Dundee and Director of the Leverhulme Research Centre of for Forensic Science. So she has been part of a, a whole series of videos which were taking place of women in science. And that's what you're going to see just now. And then following that, I'm going to ask Neve to reflect on what she said then how she feels about it now, having lived through the, the pandemic that we are all still living through. And uh, then we'll take questions and answers and continue our discussion thereafter. So I think let us now begin with the little video from Neve. <laughs> My name is Neve McDade and I am a Professor of Forensic Science at the University of Dundee. Uh, I'm also the Director of the Liverpool Research Centre for Forensic Science. So forensic science is a discipline of disciplines. So rather than having a single science um, underpinning the different types of evidence that we take into the courts. Forensic science is about using chemistry and biology and physics and mathematics and using the skills of each of those different sciences to solve a particular problem that um, is relative to a legal dispute or a legal question. Why does it matter? It matters because justice matters. It's as simple as that. And what we are obligated to do as scientists who contribute our skills to the criminal justice system is to bring the best science that we can to bear on the question because justice is about people's lives, it's about people's liberty and the most important thing we can do as scientists is use our skills and our talents and our knowledge base to help put the right people behind the bars. So part of my job as a director of um, the Liverpool Research Centre for Forensic Science is to look at not just how we use science to robustly underpin existing types of evidence like fingerprints or ballistics, but it's also about looking at the horizon and seeing what our colleagues in other areas of science are, are, are doing and see whether or not there's an aspect of new technological developments that we can use within the service of justice. And some of the things that we're doing is um, part of my team are looking at using virtual reality to uh, film crime scenes such that we can take uh, that crime scene and put it into a virtual reality space and allow expert practitioners to come into that space using VR headsets and all of that amazing technology um, to allow that expertise to be brought to a crime scene but to be brought to a crime scene remotely. So they would, would use the VR headset and communicate with somebody on the ground. And again, it's about the, the, the use of our knowledge in the best way that we can in, a, in such a way as to promote the use of good scientific understanding of the different concepts of the natural world and try to help our colleagues out in the field. So when I was very young, um, my, both of my parents are scientists. Um, my father was a chemist, he was an organic chemist, um, and my mother is a botanist. Um, and when I was very young, I remember some of my earliest memories are of being out in the wilds of County Kerry, which is in the south of the Republic of Ireland, um, being taken out on field trips with my mum when she was doing her PhD. And she used to teach us where to stand on these blanket bogs so that we didn't fall into bog holes. And we used to call it bog hopping. Um, and used to have great fun as, as relatively small children doing this. 
But one of the things that my parents taught me, both of them, was that science is about inquiry. It's about using um, uh, known facts and knowledge to help explain the world around you. And both of them ended up being fire scene investigators for the civil courts in Ireland, uh, which is uh, the, the discipline of forensic science now, one of them that I practice in as a chemist. Um, and one of the things I have distinct memories of growing up again was the conversations about how they would explain things to each other in terms of the, the, the remains of what they had seen in a fire scene on a given day. And what it taught me very, very much, and it's stayed with me ever since, is that science can be useful. It's something that can have a tangible use in the real world, that it has impact, that it has influence, and um, that it's not just something you do in a book or you do in a laboratory, um, but that it actually has a usefulness out in the real world to affect real people's lives. And that's followed me um, through the entirety of my scientific career. It's why uh, we have the Leverhulme Research Centre, because we're using science to answer tangible, real world, messy, difficult problems. Well, can I welcome Neve to this meeting and this event that we're having today? And uh, you're, you're most welcome, Neve. And Alan, it's, it's lovely to be here. <laughs> it's lovely to have you and to have <laughs> such a distinguished forensic scientist with us today because you know, you've got quite a reputation to live up to. Oh, you know, <laughs> an, an internationally noted forensic scientist who's been involved in all sorts of things, who's, who's really trying to bring the perhaps our justice system into the 21st century as well. One of the things I was really aware of from the, uh, from the, the film clip that we've just noticed is the use of VR technology in terms of taking a crime scene to someone else. And, you know, as you reflect, well, as I hope you will over the next couple of minutes on what you said then, you know, how has life changed for you in terms of this uh, pandemic? You know, we, we're, we're seeing today on the news that the, the courts are beginning to open up again. Uh, that requires forensic evidence to be brought into court. Do you anticipate using your VR technology in a, in a, a crime situation in court? Who knows? Well, it's, it's, it's a really good question. And um, the, the, the VR work that we're doing, we're, we're blessed in, in my research centre by having just some exceptionally talented people working with us. Um, um, and, and that includes around uh, the virtual reality work that we're doing. I couldn't do it because I'm not pretty good with technology, funnily enough. Um, but uh, we have some just brilliant um, uh, people within uh, the research centre. Um, and what we're looking for, the virtual reality technology is to go beyond what people are currently using it for. And the people are currently using it as a training tool, so which, which, which is obvious. Um, so you, you, you uh, set up a mock crime scene and you um, then put people into this virtual reality uh, kit, the headset, and then they can walk around and they can pick up, you know, look at things that they should pick up and so on and so forth. But we want to actually, um, as I think was, was said in the video, we want to make these kind of tools much more operational, so much more uh, useful on the front line. And in lockdown, we've been able to um, continue that piece of work because um, the, the people in, in the research centre, there's Dr. Grant Thompson and um, uh, Vincenzo, Vincenzo Ronaldo, who's the really uh, bright young man who does this, um, have been able to do it outside of having to be in a laboratory or in a space. And what we're looking at doing is creating um, a, a, a virtual representation of a scene such that um, operational practitioners can stand inside that virtual scene and enable them to make decisions about how they might process that in a forensic strategy meeting, for example. Um, so that kind of work uh, is continuing outside of, or, or in, in spite of lockdown, we can do it anyway. Um, yeah. But it's, it's a really, um, I think it's a tool that's got just amazing potential. We're only scratching the surface of what it can do. Is this the next game changer? You know, we, we've had DNA analysis as being one of the big game changers that we, we've just had that in as a, one of the Q&A questions. Uh, what's going to be the next one? Is it the virtual reality or are there other things which you see as being important in bringing justice to our courts? I, I think it's, I think technology in of itself is the next game changer. I think we're in a period of time 
uh, and we we have we have been in it post lockdown and, and and it's i think coming to to um growing into itself as it were within the current pandemic crisis that we have and that's around the influence and use of technology to enable justice to happen uh, virtual reality is part of that but we we've seen an unprecedented um disruption into our court system because the courts have gone online and the the uh, our, our colleagues within the um, legal systems, whether it's the criminal, civil or family courts are now all uh, adopting and adapting to using technology to enable them to do their business. And I think that is profoundly disruptive in a positive sense, um, because, you know, as we know from all periods of um, step changing activity, you know, things like the, the enlightenment or other um, periods of history, human beings adapt to what is around them and we're no different now but what what we are seeing is a profoundly um different set of circumstances for the provision of justice uh, across all of those three dimensions that i mentioned civil family and criminal and um, where we've had to adapt and we're using technology in that adaptation so the next big change um digital evidence is a huge uh, disruptive uh, issue within the justice system so if you go from dna what's the next big change digital evidence, how do we deal with it? What is it? How do we enable um, our justice system to cope with it? And then on top of that is just simply using digital tools, platforms like this to enable yes. justice to happen. That's a massive disruption at the moment, but in a positive sense. Absolutely. I, I've got a question that's just come in about where Scotland is uh, in relation to uh, you know other justice systems around the world. But in addition to that, I'd also I'd be keen to actually you hear your views on the fact that, you know, the, the whole justice system relies on successful communication. You know, I, I, I confess I'm a geologist, you know, it's a bit like confessing to be an alcoholic. <laughs> my name's Stuart and I'm a geologist. But, you know, we've got a phrase that we use within my science community, which is geologists are good company especially for other geologists. Now, I dare say that's true of forensic scientists as oh, well. Yes. Uh, yeah. So you've got to communicate effectively to the court, to the judge, to the, the, the lay people who are there, who, to, the, uh, to, to the jury. And how do you actually convert yourself from a, a science thinking person using science technology and science communication skills to uh, talking to uh, a lay audience? And, Again, let's put that into the context of the question of how do we do in Scotland relative to the rest of the world? I, I, it's it's a it's a, an absolutely excellent um, question and point. One of the things that um, forensic scientists and forensic practitioners need to do is to communicate the meaning of the work that they do in their laboratories. Communicate that into the context of the particular case at issue. So when we give our evidence in court one of the most fundamental things is to be able to communicate the weight of that evidence or the relevance of that evidence with all of its limitations uh, to the triers of fact and the triers of fact are the jury, so members of the public. So the communication of science is a fundamental tool that we as forensic practitioners have to master. Uh, there is no you know, ifs and buts about it. We need to be able to enable the people who have to make a difficult decision about guilt or innocence. Um, we need to enable them to understand our science and put it into the right context. So science communication is critical. Um, like many scientists, most of us, and I'm, I'm generalizing um, massively, most of us are not great at communicating. And, and if, um, if you have to stand up in a witness box in court, believe me, it is not always a pleasant experience. I'm sure. Uh, not, it's not somewhere where once you're there, you can't run away. You can't say, you know, I don't want to do this. I'm having a bad day. You're there and you have to do the job that's in front of you. Um, and I think that one of the great skills that we need as forensic practitioners to perhaps be better at is uh, science communication. And, uh, uh, you know, there's a, there's a huge opportunity for um, uh, people within my sphere of, of existence as scientists to embrace the science communication community um, and to learn from them and to work with them to enable us to communicate our scientific stories uh, mm -hmm. in terms of what, what we found within a given case um, to enable us to communicate those scientific stories in a better way. It's not to say that we're bad at it, but scientists are 
or, or we're much more comfortable in, in jargon. We're much more comfortable behind that wall because it's our comfort zone. And in court, we have to open that door. Yeah. How is Scotland doing? Scotland is doing okay, actually. Um, we, have, we are blessed, I think, in this country by having um, a, a single prosecutorial service, um, a single judicial system, a single police force and a single forensic science provider and an active and enabled research community. And um, that actually all join up. We all talk to each other. We all work together to uh, try to um, use our skills and talents in the best way that we can to serve the judicial system and to serve Scottish society. Uh, we are, are um, I think, very blessed with our judicial system at the moment because um, our judiciary are very forward thinking. We, we work with them um, quite closely uh, in the same way we work with the, with the forensic laboratory and with uh, the Lord Advocate and his colleagues in the, the prosecutorial system. And we work with them, you know, and the police service. And we work with them very closely and everybody's committed to ensuring that we get the best out of, or the best for and serve society in the best way that we can. I've got a question here about the use of virtual reality and whether that can be brought to the general public as well. But I'm also aware that you've got something going which is uh, taking forensic science into the theatre. And yes. I'm just wondering if you can comment on that. You can do a plug for your, uh, for, for your performance there. Yes, it seems one of those things that seemed like a good idea at the time. <laughs> uh, and it is a good idea. Um, so we work with a fantastic theatre company um, called First Familiar. And they are um, a group that are, are, are very much on the forefront of um, uh, performance theatre and um, theatre where the, the people that, that pay to go and to, to, to see their theatrical work actually become participants in that piece of work. So we have a, a play that we've just put online um, called The Evidence Chamber, um, which has just been listed actually in The Guardian as one of the hottest tickets in town right at the moment. So yeah, get your ticket now. Um, uh, um, and what it's about is it's about um, creating a scenario which we've worked on them with, um, to, which is a murder case and enabling the members of the public who take part in this uh, play to be the jury for this particular trial. And so they're presented with forensic evidence around DNA analysis and around forensic gait analysis, so how you walk. Um, and we've uh, produced within um, our team and uh, some of our colleagues within um, the comics team at the University of Dundee. We have the only professor of comics in the UK. What a great job. Um, and we've produced some comics that, that explain what gate, forensic gate analysis and forensic DNA analysis is. And we're looking at seeing whether or not those tools enable members of the public to understand the nuances of these types of evidence and whether or not that helps, whether or not that helps them in making their decision around the guilt or innocence of the person on trial for the jury trial that they're going to sit and listen to. So it's being um, premiered next week and we're very fortunate to have um, a whole group of crime writers are, uh, are going to be at the premiere, in, including um, the fantastic Val McDermott. So she's, she's going to be a member of our jury, which is going to be fab. That'll be fantastic. I'm looking forward to that. One of the things which has come up in one of the questions again is, you know, in science, there's very seldom a right and a wrong answer. And, you know, the, the, there's, there's a cognitive bias that can sometimes creep into some of these things. How do you tackle those and how do you get juries the barristers, the advocates, the judge themselves, to actually understand the, the, the risk and uncertainties that there may be in any sort of scientific evidence that you're putting forward? I mean, that's a, it's a really crucial and critical point. Um, there's, there's cognitive bias or confirmation bias in, in many of, of the areas and elements, and if not in all of the areas, areas and elements of uh, what we do <clears throat> as forensic scientists. Um, we have one of our team, uh, Dr. Emma Comrie, who is working on this uh, at the moment within the Leverhulme Centre. And how do, we, how do we counteract it? Well, firstly, we need to um, have an understanding about what it is, uh, that it exists, that we're all prone to it. 
um, and then look at how it might influence um, the decision making process within a forensic scientist's um, course of business or whatever it is that they're that they're looking at and uh, are working on. Um, the the enabling step is to train people so that they have an understanding of what it is, so that they have an understanding of the fact that they are prone to it, and then you can guard against it. Um, it won't necessarily make everything that that you know that can influence you in in in, in a way that biases decisions go away, but at least you're you're enabled to be able to reflect upon it. In almost all aspects of forensic evidence, um, when it's done correctly and professionally, there is a, um, a built-in peer review process to evidence that is um, analyzed and, and, and looked at and, mm -hmm. and um, uh, worked on within a forensic laboratory. So there's an opportunity in that feedback peer review process to pick up on aspects and issues that relate potentially to bias uh, and so that it can be, it can be you know, addressed at that point. So it's something that um, forensic practitioners are very attuned to. Uh, and are very conscious of and are very, very, um, uh, we work very hard to uh, enable us to not have bias, obviously affecting the sort of work that we do. Yeah. When you look back on your career and the number of different cases that you've been involved in, and taking account of the fact that the science has moved forward dramatically over the last few years, are there cases where you, you think now, oh, I wish I could go back and look at that again, knowing what I know now and knowing the, the techniques that I can apply now, which weren't available in those days. Um, not, not specifically that I can look back on now. Um, my area of expertise is in fire scene investigation and I also have, I'm a chemist by <clears throat> training, so I also have worked um, a, a reasonable amount in, in cases that involve drugs and, and some cases that relate to uh, terrorist activities. So when I reflect now <clears throat> and look back on casework that I've done in the past, the answer to your question is no, not, not that I can recall. And the, the reason why I'm confident in saying that is because my casework has always been peer reviewed. And so it, it goes, even though I am not working directly within a forensic laboratory, the professional um, aspects of the work that I do and the work that other people in my team in, in Dundee do uh, around forensic practice is to have that peer review and have that critical checking of the work that we do. So we catch those aspects um, and we, we ensure that what we're saying in terms of reporting our, uh, the outcomes of our <clears throat> tests that they are um, not biased in, in any way, but also that it's at the, the a level of um, surety that we can be at mm -hmm. in terms of delivering the information that we can. One of the critical things about, in, in my view, about um, presenting forensic evidence within a report or within the courts is also to present the limitations of that evidence. And that's something we've always done. Yes. Uh -huh. I think on, on television these days, we have a, a vast amount of forensic science that is actually fed out to the, the general public. And the general public may be thinking that they are now more forensically aware than they ever have been. And indeed, this may be encouraging young people to, to think of forensic science as a career. Yes. I must confess when, I, you know, I've been involved in public engagement in science, particularly in, in earth sciences, but whenever I was asked about that, my, my advice to young people was, first of all, go out and be a scientist, and then you can think about engaging the public in it. You know, a lot of young people are thinking about forensic science as a, as a possible career. What's your advice to them? Um, my advice has, has never wavered from the very first time I got asked that question many years ago, and that is exactly as yours, go out and be a scientist first. Um, forensic science needs good scientists. We need people who are trained in chemistry and physics and biology and the, the core natural sciences or mathematics and statistics, the core natural sciences. Um, uh, do that first, you know, and it's, it's, it's much more important that uh, people who get into this um, this area of work have got core understanding of science and we can bolt on the forensic applications later maybe in a master's degree or in a PhD but the critical things are to understand what science is and understand the the fundamental nature of um, scientific endeavor and inquiry um, and also to be a 
good at numbers. You need to have, you need to understand statistics as one of, one of the things that most people don't like to do. Um, <laughs> you need to be numerate, you need to understand statistics and you need to be a good communicator. Um, so, so anything that involves science communication now is becoming even more critically important. Um, and as I said, we can bolt on all of the other forensic parts of it um, once once people progress outside of uh, an undergraduate degree in science. Um, it's 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 a it's a it's a fundamental need within our um, discipline of disciplines um, because what we have to do as forensic practitioners is solve problems. So we need to be mm-hmm. problem solvers, and we need to be able to bring our skills as scientists or indeed engineers or mathematicians in to solve that problem. As a whole, do you think that scientists are becoming better at not hiding behind the jargon? This is a, another question that we've had. And, uh, you know, just reflecting on the, the fact that we've had to put scientists up in front of the general public on all, a daily basis to explain what's happening with the, the COVID pandemic. Uh, are, do you, what's your reflection on that as someone who's really had to focus on that in a, in a courtroom situation? Are we getting better at it? I think we're getting less scared of it. That doesn't necessarily make us better at it. No. <laughs> um, I think that, you know, at the moment, um, the role that science and scientists are playing uh, in just providing information to the public is profound and it's profoundly shifted, I think, um, again, partly brought on by by the current uh, pandemic um, situation that we find ourselves in. But it's really important that members of the public remember what science actually is and that science is not a black and white, it's not an absolute. Science is about gathering knowledge and, and using that knowledge in order to try to understand what the issue problem, et cetera, is of the day and knowing that a scientific approach or following the science means that you iterate it, it shifts and it changes as we get more information and more knowledge. And forensic science is no different in that respect. So it, it's one of the most important things, I think that um, as forensic scientists or scientists in general communicating information to the public is to try to get across the fact that science is an iterative process. It is not a black and white and mm-hmm. it changes and it evolves as we get more information about the particular thing that it is that we're talking about. Um, de-jargonizing it, I think is critical. Um, uh, and you know, my, my hat goes off to my colleagues who are out there with um, the first minister and indeed the prime minister and others in doing that. I think they're doing a great job and doing it very effectively. Yes. Your video right at the beginning was part of a whole series of videos about women in science. And there seems to be quite a lot of women in forensic science, you know, and I'm delighted to to see that. Why is that area of activity so successful in attracting and nurturing women to rise to the top within that particular area? Gosh, that's a really good question that I really don't have the answer to. (laughs) Um, (laughs) In in terms of um, uh, women that are involved within the practice, you're absolutely right. When, When I used to um, be involved more on the front line of, of teaching forensic science at master's level. Um, we would always get large cohorts of MSc students coming onto our course, the majority of which, 90% of which were, were women. Um, I don't know, maybe it's because our particular branch of science application is very applied. Maybe it's because um, it's about problem solving. Um, forensic science is about combining whole multiplicity of aspects and skills that involve being numerate, it involves being a good scientist, it involves being a problem solver, a negotiator, a communicator. So maybe it's all of those things together that women have got significant skills in, I think, um, that brings them into this discipline. But the answer is, I don't know. There are not that many female professors of forensic science. It has got better uh, over the years. But when I got my um, professorship, I was I think probably, if I'm not mistaken, the first female professor of forensic science in Scotland. I was certainly the first female professor of forensic science at the university that I was at at that time. Um, and those, you know, those ceilings, those glass ceilings that we mm-hmm. put uh, across ourselves are certainly breaking down and that has to be a good thing. Oh, indeed, yes. <laughs> Uh, We're coming to the end, but I do want to put a final question to you. So in order to answer this, I'm afraid you'll have to get out your grandmother's uh, crystal ball, I'm afraid. Oh, gosh. uh, Really, (laughs) you know, you're a good Irish lass, so you Mm. must be able to do this. Uh, It's looking to the future. 
And it's looking to see where we would be in perhaps another 20 years or so. What are the technologies which you'll be applying then? Uh, what, what are the changes which you would foresee in your particular area of activity within that scope of time? Gosh, that's, that's actually, uh, it's quite a difficult question to answer now. Um, if you'd asked me uh, um, this time three months ago, it might have been an easier question to answer. <laughs> I think that uh, where we currently are um, within the justice um, uh, scenario, the justice system, uh, we have seen profound step changes around the use of technology, um, around the embracing of technology. We were on the edge of it. But now we've had, because of the current situation that we're in, we've had to embrace it. And so I don't think that we can go back from that now. I think that we're now on a different journey and a different pathway. Um, so what are going to be the big changes that happen within the next 20 years? Um, we're going to have a huge impact um, of things like machine learning and um, artificial intelligence. And a lot of people use those words. So, you know, artificial intelligence has been around for quite a, 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 a time. Um, I think that understanding truly what those uh, techniques and tools are and how they will be implemented within the justice space is going to be quite profound. Um, what is that going to lead to? Are we going to look at triaging court cases so that a computer will decide your, your, you know, your, your speeding fine or whatever it is and, and, and deal with cases at that level so that we relieve some of the pressure that our justice system is under in terms of just turnaround time for court cases. It's a particular issue at the moment. Will we have robots that are going to go out into crime scenes and collect evidence for us? Will we abandon all of the current areas of evidence that we collect, like footwear marks and, and tool marks and um, uh, uh, paint and glass and so on and so forth? And will we have robots that will simply go in, scan a scene with a, with a, with a nice piece of kit that will tell us who was there um, and, and automatically um, uh, bring those people to justice. I don't know. Uh, I think we're on the edge of a real revolution. Um, and I think Scotland is so brilliantly placed to, to be the forefront of how we adapt ourselves now uh, with the tools that our society has um, to be actually at the vanguard of that and really starting to shape what happens in the future. Well, we'll, we'll meet again in 20 years time, Dave, and oh, no. we'll try <laughs> reflect on, on these last, this last half hour and see just how much of that has come true. Ladies and gentlemen, I think we've come to the end now, so I would like you all to just thank me for, for giving us this uh, insight into just what it's like to be a forensic scientist, to give us some guidance as to what the future might be within this area, and just to show that women can actually break the glass ceiling and actually be top of the profession as Neve is today. So thank you very much, Neve. We're very Thanks grateful so to you. Absolutely a pleasure. Thank you, everybody. Bye.